Okay, yeah, so thank you for having me. Uh, my name's Jamie Poole. Um, I'm the Compute Platform Engineering Manager at G Research, and I'm here today to talk to you about Armada, which is a application which we've created at GR to enable massive scale run to completion batch jobs on Kubernetes. This is something which we're currently using in production, running millions of jobs through a day across tens of thousands of nodes. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the application itself, the motivation for it, uh, how we use it, its architecture, um, some lessons learned, some challenges we've had, and also some successes along the way, a little bit about the roadmap, and then explain to you how we can use it, how you can use it. Um, first, I'm gonna quickly cover G Research, who we are and what we do. So G Research is a fintech company based in London, in England. That's our shiny new office in central London, which uh, has just opened. Uh, we employ teams of quantitative researchers to look for patterns in noisy real-world data sets, financial data, ultimately to look for and create algorithms that can be deployed as trading strategies that can be monetized. Um, as a company, we've existed for about 20 years and we've, we've grown quite a lot in that time. Um, however, onto Armada. So what is Armada? Um, Armada is a multi-Kubernetes cluster batch scheduler. I mentioned that we're about 20 years old. When we started as a company, uh, everything back then was very Windows and .NET framework based. Anyone working in FinTech would have experienced that. Um, over the last five to six years, especially, we've migrated heavily towards Linux because that's where all the latest ML and AI action is. And along with that, we've migrated to containerization by default and Kubernetes became the de facto container orchestration platform in that time. We had a lot of success running our stateless services and uh, other applications on Kubernetes. So we thought to ourselves, it would be pretty cool if we could also run all of our batch workloads there. So in terms of what we do, the vast majority of our compute, all on-prem, is actually used for running batch jobs because typically our researchers want to run some experiments, run some software to crunch some numbers and then spit out an answer. So historically, doing all this on Windows, we were using HD Condor and we saw the pivot to Linux and containers as an opportunity to work out if we could do this on Kubernetes. Because we'd had so much success with the services, we figured if we could have a common substrate for all of our compute to be Kubernetes, it would be really advantageous for all of the reasons which we've already heard about today. Same reason everyone's sort of trying to do this, I suppose. Um, and that's really where Armada was born. Armada was conceptually an application where we thought if we could add the missing features on top of Kubernetes um, of effectively queuing fair share and scaling, then we would get all the ecosystem benefits of running on Kubernetes and have the just general benefit of having all of our compute on a common substrate. We started having this conversation back in 2019, I think it was, in Barcelona, at KubeCon. Um, and there was other people who were interested, so we figured we'd open source the project from the start. Um, and recently, in fact, it's been um, accepted into the CNCF sandbox, so it's now a sandbox application, which is pretty cool. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we actually use Armada, and then I'm gonna dive into the architecture and what's inside that big middle box. Fundamentally, what we have at GR is a large number of um, users and applications who want to submit jobs and get some answers. The big box in the middle is Armada, which I'm gonna dive into, and that contains tens of thousands of nodes, many tens of clusters. I've got some stats in the bottom right you can read there. And typically, the workflow, as I described, is a user has an image, a container image, or has either an existing one or has just created a new one, submits some jobs to Armada, they get scheduled, images get pulled, containers start up, they access lots and lots of data from storage platforms or other application services, crunch the numbers, do some maths, and then write out a result somewhere. Now, this picture here is really one, what we would call Armada environment, so we have many environments within G Research. When I say environment, I, I guess I mean something like development, staging, production. Within production, we have multiple environments as well in different data centers. This is what one particular data center might look like. So there's some core concepts which it's important to understand about the system. These will be familiar to anyone who's experienced an HPC, probably all of you guys, but I'll go through them anyway. So we have a job. In, in Armada sense, this is 
a, a group of related Kubernetes resources, but fundamentally, mostly, it's a pod spec. And this is something which uh, a user wants to be created. A job set is purely a group of related jobs that you want to manage as a unit, so submit together, watch progress together, and cancel or you know whatever together. And then a queue, which is a sort of uh, a standard queue of jobs where queues can have a priority relative to each other, and also jobs within a queue can have a priority relative to themselves. And it's these two dimensions that we mostly use to implement our fair share algorithm, which is pretty similar to what you'll find on Condor. We have a simple gRPC API that users use to talk to, or applications. And then users ultimately subscribe to events on these uh, through the API to track progress of their jobs or job sets. So they will see that a job has go from queued to pending to running, and then ultimately hopefully succeed or sometimes fail for whatever reason. So now I'm going to talk a bit about how users access it before getting into the actual nuts and bolts of how it works. So on the left here, we've got a bit of YAML, which is the simplest possible Armada job specification. Fundamentally, we've got a little bit of Armada metadata at the top around the queue, the job set name, the namespace you want it to run in in Kubernetes, and then underneath, uh, a pod spec. Now under here, this is just a raw Kubernetes pod spec. You can put anything that a pod supports in here could go into here, which means that anything that you can do with a pod in Kubernetes, you can do through Armada. Most of this is just passed straight through, but some certain fields are used for scheduling decisions, such as things like node selectors, tolerations, things like that. We've then built a simple CLI, which is called Armada CTL, similar to how you would use something like kubectl. So this is meant for interactive human use, really. And this allows you to submit jobs or sets of jobs and then do things like watch their progress and you get a simple bit of output there, which is probably too small to read, but it will, it will move as you press, after you press enter and you'll be able to see transition state changes. And then the bottom right here, we've got a screenshot of our UI. So we've built a, a UI for the system, which we call Lookout. Um, it's just a simple React UI. This screenshot is actually of a prototype for a U new UI, which we're going to be creating in the coming months. The one we have at the moment is similar, but a lot more basic. And we want to put a lot of time into investing in this UI, making it much easier for people to use the system and reason about what's going on. But this allows you to do all the things you'd expect from a user perspective, to see the status of jobs, progress, find out why they've failed, find out why they're not scheduled yet. And we also want to flip it around and make it really useful for administrators of the platform as well to reason about how many nodes are in the system, how much compute we have, and so forth. So now I'll get into the actual architecture of the system, how it's been built. So everything on this diagram, anything in a light blue box is a Kubernetes cluster, and anything in a light yellow box is a Kubernetes namespace. So first I'm going to talk about the left-hand side of this picture. So this is what we will call the server side of Armada. We have, by convention, it could be anything, but we, we always put things in our Armada namespace. And here we have a couple of applications. We have the API and the UI, which are the applications which we've built. And then some other components which we've chosen to use to, for the, the backing stores for our system. So we use a combination of Pulsar and Redis for events and job, specific, uh, job stored in queues. We also make heavy use of Prometheus for monitoring, as you'd expect. Uh, and then there's the slightly random elephant on the outside there for the Postgres database, which we use for the system. We're actually probably at a point of like peak complexity at the moment, I'd say, because we've got, been on a bit of a transition through the architecture. So we're probably going to move away from Redis and just use Postgres. But at the moment, we have a few of these components mixed around. So this is all running on a single Kubernetes cluster in this, this case. Uh, I've put a note there as well. We use Flatcar as our operating system, but that's not particularly relevant. But if we just had the, the cluster on the left-hand side, this wouldn't really do anything. This just presents our API and UI. It would allow users to submit jobs and watch stuff, but nothing would actually happen. The clusters on the right-hand side are where the actual action happens. So these are what we call our executive clusters. So you will notice there's multiple, and I'll come to that in a second. If we just look at one of them, what we basically have is a namespace here called Armada and a simple component deployed into it called the executor. This component is the thing that's responsible for sitting there looking at how much free resource there is in the cluster, talking back to the server and saying, hey, I've got, I've got this much compute, give me some jobs. And if there's anything queued, it will lease those jobs and then spawn them in the relevant namespaces. I've actually labeled them as jobs here. 
However, they are just pure Kubernetes pods. So it's, it ties in quite neatly with all the other stuff we've been describing this morning and this afternoon. Um, possibly in, in future, as the job API evolves, we could imagine actually just using that. But we just use plain pods because the furniture around the job API at the moment is kind of redundant to us. And then the executor's job is really just to sit there, lease new, um, lease new jobs, schedule pods onto the cluster, and then trace their progress and report status back to the exec, uh, back to the server side, which then users would experience through the UI or the API. Now, these clusters on the right-hand side tend to be quite large, so we have a large amount of on-prem compute here. What we've found is we want to be able to scale to all of our computers and use all of them to run our jobs on, and to be able to scale effectively and definitely. Now, we know that we can scale a given Kubernetes cluster to many thousands of nodes. You look at what OpenAI have done, fantastic work there to scale to 7,500 nodes and beyond, but that's actually quite a lot of work to do that. So what we decided to do was devise a system whereby we didn't have to push Kubernetes to its absolute limits. And if we could just deploy multiple of these clusters, we could just scale horizontally that way, effectively and definitely. So what we tend to do is run these clusters up to about 1,000 nodes at a time, um, and then just have multiple of them. So now I'm gonna dive into the actual anatomy of one of these executive clusters and the sort of considerations and design we've made around these, because this is most important around how many jobs we can schedule. So we have the sort of standard Kubernetes control plane, which you would expect, the head nodes running the regular Kubernetes control plane components, API server, controller manager, so on. We have three what we call system nodes. These are to run cluster-wide resources for things we decide in GR that we want to, to use, such as Cert Manager, Dragonfly, uh, which I'll come to, Open Policy Agent, and other things. And then we just have N of what we call batch nodes, and these are the jobs, uh, these are the nodes that we actually run the jobs on. We want to minimize the amount of resources that our cluster requires are on these nodes so that we can maximize the amount available for jobs. So we take very close attention to the daemon sets that we run on these things and the resources requested, um, limits and so forth, on these nodes. And we run the absolute bare minimum of things like the CNI, Q proxy, storage integration pods, Dragonfly as a, as a caching layer, and then as many jobs as possible. So we made some key choices along the way for scaling Kubernetes itself in this way. So we have what we consider large clusters, a thousand nodes, but I know it's possible to go bigger. For these anyway, we've decided to use bare metal for all of our estates, including the master nodes and system nodes. We keep the etcd nodes virtual because through the, this Armada architecture, we don't actually store a huge amount of data in etcd itself. Almost all of it, metadata-wise, is stored inside the Armada storage components. However, we've still scaled up the control plane components within Kubernetes and just made the etcd nodes as big as they needed to be. We've done a lot of work around tuning Prometheus and the CNI, but actually one thing we've really found, which I think is remarkable and worth noting, is that we haven't had to do a huge amount to Kubernetes to make it work this well. Most of the interesting scaling work we found was actually in the dependencies. So silly things like we use Terraform to build our clusters, and the first time we went to 1,000 nodes, we actually found that all of a sudden, maybe unsurprisingly, our plan and apply times went, went to hell and were really terrible. We did a small amount of refactoring there and actually found we could 10x the performance, um, the, the plan and apply time in Terraform just by rejigging the way we represented those resources. Dragonfly has been massively beneficial for us. So if you suddenly scale to thousands of nodes, you're gonna need to pull lots of images. Um, that's a very quick way to destroy your container registry, whatever it is, or get locked out of Docker Hub, say. So Dragonfly is a, a tool which you can deploy, an open source tool on top of Kubernetes, which is like a caching layer for Docker images with its own peer-to-peer -peer network, such that if you have a thousand nodes all pulling a new image, it goes through this Dragonfly component inside the cluster, there's a single pull from the upstream registry, and then it's all distributed in the peer-to-peer -peer network across the nodes. And then a lot of work to scale our storage platforms. On the security front, we're a very security conscious organization. So this is a multi-tenanted environment. We have users all sharing the same platform, so we need a lot of focus on security. We don't want any user or administrator to be able to accidentally access anyone else's data or on purpose. So we've got the standard sort of security rules you'd expect around um, user workloads. So things like good RBAC in namespaces, um, principle of least privilege, and then all the standard stuff around no root, no privilege, no host networking or uh, storage access, no extra limits capabilities. We've implemented most of this just using either built-ins in Kubernetes, such as good RBAC, 
uh, and then a couple of extra tools. So Open Policy Agent has been really beneficial for us. That's a great way of just uh, ensuring that these things are true and can't be, uh, can't be violated. And we also make heavy use at the moment of pod security policy, although we know that's deprecated and will go away. So we're going to replace that soon enough. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about some challenges that we've had along the way. There's probably like four categories of things that we've found really difficult, I think. The first thing, scaling to this size, just running Kubernetes at this size um, is very difficult operationally. You have to be very good at managing Kubernetes and rolling out changes reliably. Um, the biggest thing probably is performance, and in fact, not of the system itself, as I said, but actually what you realize is when you suddenly are running batch jobs at this scale in your environment, you've effectively created a giant DDoS machine. And anything you point it at, you can, if it hasn't been scaled properly, you can reliably destroy. So we found that quite a lot with, um, especially our storage clusters, that when we scaled to this size, possibly we didn't appropriately scale the storage. And we've had situations where users have suddenly launched a large, large number of jobs destroyed the performance themselves, and unfortunately other people who are also using the same shared resources. So that's something that is always a constant challenge. We need to work out how to improve as much as possible. Then the next two really are integration type problems, where along our particular journey, we've been doing all of this at the same time as moving from Windows to Linux. And I think we've all definitely underestimated how much work that would actually be for everybody. It's not, as you can imagine, just a case of doing some find and replace for backslashes, for forward slashes. Um, we have, we're slowly realizing quite how entrenched the Windows behavior is within our software. Um, and it's been a lot of work to help people move away from that. Silly things like using DFS as a uh, pattern for accessing storage. And then the last thing really is a side effect of all of these other challenges, whereby because of all this stuff taking up our time, we haven't found enough time to really invest in the tooling and make the experience of using the platform as good as it can be, which can be a bit frustrating. I feel like we're starting to turn the corner on that now and putting some of these previous things to bed, we can now focus on improving the tooling for our users as much as possible. Um, successes, so we're one of these organizations that are always striving for continuous improvement and I think like a lot of us do this, it can kind of make us focus on the negatives a lot of the time and we need to, I think, take the time to stop and acknowledge successes and celebrate these things. So for me, for along this whole project, the things that have been really great are we've, we've proven that Kubernetes and Armada scale really well and don't seem to be at any kind of limit. When we started doing this, I think people were queuing up at my desk to explain why Kubernetes wasn't designed to run batch jobs and couldn't ever possibly work. And they're right, it wasn't designed for it, but we've proven that actually with not a huge amount of effort, it can be made to do these things. We've had really good quality distributed metrics has been a big success for us, so I'd definitely recommend doing that because you need to be able to reason about the platform and see what's going on. And then after that point, a lot of the Kubernetes um, wins really started to pay off. So because we're using Kubernetes, we get all these sorts of ancillary benefits around making configuration changes really easy. We could just, if we need to suddenly change something across all of our estate, it's a couple of pull requests and running our automation pipelines and changes just go out, which is fantastic. Furthermore, because we're on Kubernetes, we get all the integration for free with all the other tools that we might want to use. So Dragonfly, again, is a great example of this. We realized when scaling that we'd need to do something to protect our upstream registry. If we weren't on Kubernetes, I don't know exactly what we would have done. We'd have probably either had to hope something already existed that did it for our platform or build something ourselves. Whereas because we're running on Kubernetes, we just Google it and oh, there it is and you deploy it and it mostly works. And then finally, the, mo the modular cluster design of Armada itself has been a massive win for us. So it's taken the stress out of applying configuration changes, things like Kubernetes upgrades. We can stage them. Obviously, we test things in dev and staging, but when, even when you get to production, as we all know, with the best will in the world, that's often where you, f you find the problems for the first time. With this design, we can apply, we can choose certain clusters of canary clusters, and we can upgrade these first sit back and observe and go, oh, actually everything is okay, or oh crap, something has gone wrong that we didn't spot, and then roll back or fix it. And it's greatly preferable to lose one, I don't know, one twentieth of the calc farm as opposed to all of it. So I'm gonna briefly touch on the roadmap here for 2023. Um, there's three categories of things on here, really. Um, there's a lot more going on within G research, but this is the stuff which is specific, uh, not specific to GR in general, to the, the platform itself. So firstly, it's the observability piece. So we wanna put a lot of work into this UI so that people can better understand what's going on and our administrators can better understand what's going on. 
we spend a lot of time answering user questions saying, hey, why isn't my job running? And we can work it all out through Grafana and other things, but it's much better if they can just have a UI that explains that, yes, it's queued because you've already capped out on the amount of resource you're allowed on our compute or, I don't know, for some other reason. Possibly they've asked for something which can't be scheduled at that time. Um, the second category of thing is around smarter scheduling. So we're enabling, we, it's already possible to do the things like basic preemption through Armada, um, basic GAN scheduling, all of these sorts of things we want to be able to do, you can kind of prefix with basic. But what we want to be able to do is do all of these things in a bit more of a smart and native way so that it's possible for us to really easily offer these features to people which are the, the next big enabling things post the basics around fair share and queuing and so forth. And then the last thing, which I put in Q4, but actually I'm having a lot of conversations about just this week, I want to try and bring in a lot, is a bit more native Kubernetes integration. You will probably have seen from the design that in a way we've kind of been a bit sort of keeping Kubernetes at arm's length. When we, when we first started designing the system, we were kind of hedging our bets because we weren't sure if we actually wanted to use Kubernetes as the substrate for this and, hey, it would be nice if we could be a bit optional about this and maybe use Armada as a system on top of another platform. It's probably the case, to be honest, now that ship has sailed and Kubernetes is well embedded as the standard platform for running containers. So I think we'd like to now make it a little bit more accessible for people through Kubernetes so it's just easier for people to reason about. So things such as having a, either using the Kubernetes API directly or having an API that looks exactly like it, uh, maybe a couple of simple CRDs and so forth. So now just a slide on how you can use it. So we've got... Um, our own Slack channel since being sandboxed in the CNCF Slack, so please use that. It's just hashtag Armada. Come in there, ask questions. Lots of friendly people there. Um, we have our obviously our GitHub page because it's all open source. Uh, the link is at the end of this presentation, so please take a look at that. Uh, I guess we've got the, of course, Alex's group, which was discussed just now, exactly for this kind of product. This, amongst other things. And I'm also going to do a shout out to the CNCF Research User Group, which me and Ricardo run um, every every other Wednesday. Um, I can't remember the time now. It's 8, it's 8 a.m. as well, PST, isn't it? So do come along to that, where we talk about things like this and others. And that's everything I have. Do we have any questions? Thank you. How this is different than the Kubernetes Federation project like uh, Carmeda or uh, Open Cluster Management projects? I didn't quite catch that, I'm sorry. So how this is different than the Kubernetes Federation project? Which, so, which Kubernetes project? Federation. Federation thank you, sorry. Um, so the question is how does this differ from Kubernetes Federation? Uh, it, I guess in a way it solves a similar kind of problem that, that I was trying to solve. I think that is a bit more generic in the sense that it was a way of federating all sorts of Kubernetes resources. Um, we want to be able to, in effect, I suppose, federate jobs to multiple clusters, but very specifically those things. And as a design choice, we've decided to keep the storage of the state outside of Kubernetes itself, because there are limits to how much you can put in etcd. And you can imagine as well, if, we want, if you want to destroy the system, it's preferable to overload Armada itself, and they'll, it'll have its own limits, but in such a way that you don't overwhelm the actual cluster that you're actually running on, so you don't want to brick the whole thing. Um, so I suppose that's how it's similar but different to Federation. Uh, at the moment, we support a subset of things. So it's pod specs. I think we actually also include services and so forth so that you can run distributed jobs. Um, but yeah, at the moment, it's just really, it's quite tightly bound to the resources which we've found we've needed within our within our company. Um, if you would like to use any Kubernetes ecosystem tools that allow you to run on top of Kubernetes, like Argo Workflow, Spark Operator, Kubeflow, um, it will not work, right, with Armada? You need to really like build dedicated integration layer for, for Armada for these tools to At work. At the moment, yes. That's one of the main reasons, actually, for looking at moving a bit closer to the Kubernetes API because then it would make integration with all these other tools much easier. Um, at the moment, it, anything that talks to Armada needs to understand its API. So you could access it through those things, but you'd need to write some kind of 
layer to do that, that transformation. More questions? Uh, you're talking about users and different users on the system. Um, how does that flow through from Armada into Kubernetes? Do you create service accounts or what, what do you use mm -hmm. in the, in the back end? So what we do in the back end is we tend to have a one-to-one -one mapping between queues and namespaces. So we have our own automation, which we use to apply definitions of uh, both those things, where we, uh, another thing which I think we should open source, which is a, a effectively a tool which says there's a bunch of definitions. This is the queue. Alice is accessible by these users, which are users that Kubernetes understands. Uh, it has these other you know, priorities and other, so, other things, and that gets translated into namespaces within Kubernetes. So then users themselves can kubectl and access their own namespaces and their own jobs if they want to. Although we try and encourage everyone to use the sort of official tooling to do that. So it all gets translated that way. I can ask one then. Because we discussed a lot about batch and other topics, but here you mentioned a lot about multi-cluster. Mm. And um, I think in the initial definition of the batch working group, it was explicitly stated that multi-cluster wasn't uh, something that would be focused or or scheduling across clusters. No? Okay, b because, yeah, we were just talking about uh, um, like instantiated resources across clusters, accessing yep. the jobs, do you access through the Armada APIs or can you actually talk directly to the clusters, things like this. So wh where do you see this this could fit in in Kubernetes and cloud native this discussion because we we heard about federation projects yeah so how how can we push this forward I it's think? it's a yeah so it's a really interesting problem um, I think the multi cluster thing the approach we've taken is probably like the USP for our application it's the I haven't seen anything else which supports a, a multi cluster setup as well as this however it's something that everyone wants to do and it, all of these discussions it's really interesting to listen to everyone have their own sort of solving this in their own way. I kind of feel like we're in this Cambrian explosion of people trying to run batch on Kubernetes and we're all going to develop different ways of doing things. And eventually we're going to have to see some things, some things win, some things lose, and I, I guess sort of converge on the right ways of doing things. I don't know what the answer is right now for multi-cluster, but it feels like something which should be a bit more somehow available through Kubernetes, in a, not, not in a sort of federation kind of way. But I, ultimately, I think what we'd like to see is as many of these sorts of capabilities that we've developed here being pushed into the platform so that we can then opt out doing ourselves and use them. And maybe eventually this all falls away. I, just, I don't know. But until that point, we, we need to solve our problems. So this is what we do. So, so we do have the multi-cluster SIG, right? And they did, they have other, like, it's not only batch. There's stateful workloads as well, right? Mm. Like, how do you move storage? Like, uh, how do you migrate, like, you know, volumes? Um, how, what do you represent? How do you represent a workload? Yeah. Um, because a workload is not necessarily a part or even a job. It's a collection of things, resources that you instantiate and cluster, etc. Yeah. I feel this is much bigger than batch. Or, I mean, batch is one massive use case for it. Yeah. But there are many other use cases for multi-cluster. It, it, um, it, there is, there, yeah. I, my take on this, and you'll probably talk about it in the panel discussion later, is it's it's okay to have different solutions for things. And I think I'll, sometimes we try too hard to try and come up with one, one ring to rule them all and then fail because it's, things end up just too generic and you suffer from this genericide concept. Um, ultimately, we'll probably settle on, I think, a smaller number of patterns for running software, whether it's services, batch, and a small-ish number of other things. And if we have different ways of solving multi-cluster for that smaller set of things, that at least is common within those sets, that's probably fine. I think trying to be too grand about it and have federation for all or something might just be a bit too ambitious, and that's why you, you just spin your wheels forever. That's probably why federation didn't succeed. Indeed. Before. Yeah, that's, that's my view anyway. Thanks. Uh, it was a great talk. Can you talk a little bit, I guess, about the general question of how you've done storage with this? Like, you've got users running all their ML models. How are they getting their training data in there? How are you yeah. making it so that, with multi-tenancy especially, it seems mm -hmm. like a really hard problem? Yeah, sure. 
So within uh, our world, we tend to use most of our storage on shared storage platforms. So we use things like Isilon. Uh, we're actually moving quite heavily to using Vast as a storage platform. I saw that on someone's slides previously. Um, we have a good multi-tenancy setup on those platforms already where users or groups of users already have areas they can access. You almost think of it like a bucket, I suppose, in S3, which they're already perm to use. Uh, through sort of convention, I suppose, we allow users to access those resources through Armada, through Kubernetes. So it's easy for people to run a job and have a templated way of accessing their personal area or some shared area on, on Isilon or Vast to, to load their data. And a lot of the performance work we've been going and looking at is how we actually make that interaction as good as possible because you can really make people's lives a lot easier, a lot better or worse by making that integration work better or worse. More questions? While I'm hitting there. It's going to make you walk. Yeah. <laughs> no, while I'm walking there, like, why do you use Postgres? Why don't you put everything on the API server? Or like on its CD? Everything in the Kubernetes API server. Um, yeah, why do you need an extra storage? Why do we need external storage? Yeah, sure. That, I guess that's one of the motivators for the architecture. We, back of a napkin calculations when we first started doing this told us that the amount of data we need to store, because we have requirements to store millions of jobs and have a huge amount of throughput and churn through the system, is that putting all that in etcd would definitely break it if we didn't do anything, and we'd have to tune it pretty hard to even make it possible, given an awful lot of storage. And then we've got the other thing I mentioned previously around failure domains, I guess, where if you then break etcd, you've actually completely broken the cluster that you're even running the platform on, and you then can't access it, and you've you know cut off the branch that you're sitting on kind of thing. So. That was the motivation for that. However, if that could be solved, then again, that was a, is a further simplification we can make. I think a lot of these parts of our design have been uh, optimizations we've made along the way, but I'm, I'm never too, we're not too precious to say we won't ever change something. And if an optimization is no longer required, then we should reevaluate that. And that's what we'll try and do. Yeah, you, you talked a lot about the infrastructure behind the system, and it looks interesting. In terms of like uh, the scheduling algorithms, are you dealing with lots of very large jobs and placement of those jobs, and maybe with like fragmented placement of these these large scheduled or smaller yeah, scheduled yeah, that's, that's a really good question. So I actually skimmed over that a little bit. I didn't have any written <laughs> notes, and I remembered I wanted to talk about it. We have quite a large range of different types of jobs. So we have everything from jobs which run for some seconds up to possibly even some weeks. Um, so we want to be we want to be as clever as possible about how we schedule these things, and then also we've got the headaches around maintenance. Where if you've suddenly got every node in your cluster is running a job that runs for two weeks, how on earth do you patch everything? So at the moment we're in that situation, but we're working towards a world through improving uh, our scheduling component to put things a little bit smarter together. And I'll point to Alvin Severinsen over there, who's doing a lot of the work um, to make that a little bit more clever. And ultimately, we're trying to work to a world in, in GR anyway where all users' workloads are completely preemptible. And then a lot of these sorts of problems are a little easier to deal with because you can be a little less precious about making sure things are scheduled in the right places and so forth. We have time for one more question. No? Um, so what do you find like your users most comfortable with when ob like trying to observe their jobs? Is it mm -hmm. using like explicitly looking at metrics or do they want to look at statuses or do they want to use um, kubectl or whatever like tool? What, yeah. what are they? Uh, yes, yeah, so what, what are users most comfortable with? Um, I think frustratingly for us, they always want a UI, I find. And that's because our users in particular are not experts in Kubernetes, containers, even Linux, some of them. They're, these are, their day job is trying to do ML or, you know, they're basic mathematicians. Um, so typically people want tools to use that are easy to understand. And it's either UIs that we build or meta applications on top of Armada, which other bits of our engineering organization have, have produced. But we have a, a massive range. So we have some users who are effectively power users who are perfectly happy running kubectl or Armada CTL or whatever. And then other people who just don't want to know and just want to use the UI. So we kind of have to support everything, which is one of the challenges. 
uh, one last comment. You took a picture, but like, how do you prove to your wife that you are in there? So you should have taken a selfie. I should have done a selfie. I will yeah. do that. I'm being told to stop. So I, if I can have a selfie with being <laughs> told to stop in the background as well, I think that would be best, wouldn't it? Is it going to work? All right, you can all tell me to go away. Three, two, one. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> all right, thank you, everyone. Thank you. We're, we have a coffee break. We'll be back in... 250.